All right, welcome back, everybody. This is going to be a video over section 9-7. Um, here's the warm-up. Again, if you're watching along from home, make sure you pause, do the warm-up, and then play whenever you're ready. So in section 9-6, we learned that um, you, we, we can factor things down. And then once you have it fully factored down, you can set each piece equal to zero and then solve. Like, for example, for this first one, what is this first one factored down to be? The, the factors. Um, five and one, right? So we look at the factors of five that had to get to six. They're one times five. So we know that that's x plus one, x plus five. And we said that either this could be zero or this could be zero. So we make two little mini equations for ourselves. We solve each of them separately. We subtract the one. We subtract the five. So those are our two solutions. How could you check your answer? Well, you can plug it back in if you wanted to. Plug it back in and make sure you get zero in the end. What's the weird part about number two? It's not standard form. It's not set equal to zero. So just move the eight over to the other side. Add eight to the left side, and that will give me x squared minus 6x plus 8 equals zero. And now we can factor what are the factors of 8 that had to get to negative 6? Negative 4, negative 2. Both negative. X minus 4, X minus 2. And then we can set each of them equal to 0. Add the 4, add the 2. Again, a lot of that is not new. A lot of that is just review of chapter 8. The only new piece is setting it equal to 0 in the end and solving, which really isn't that difficult. Now, the last part here, or the last question here. How many of you guys, be honest, how many of you guys tried to factor it by hard type method? What did we forget? GCF. There is a GCF. Now, you will see that if you factor this by hard type, you probably get the same answer. But there is a GCF. You pull out the 2, and that's going to leave us with an x squared plus 5x minus 14. And we can see that the factors, see, I'm going to bring this down here. The factors of negative 14 that had to get to positive 5 are negative 2 times 7. So x minus 2, x plus 7 equals 0. Now, does that 2 have any, any influence on my zeros? No. No. It has no influence on my zeros. It does not, does not affect them at all. The only zeros that I have here are x is equal to positive 2. Sorry, x minus 2 equals 0. x is equal to positive 2. x plus 7 is equal to 0, so x is equal to negative 7. Negative 7, positive 2. That 2 just kind of cancels out sitting on the end. You would only use that as one of your zeros if it factored out as a GCF with a variable. That two does other things, like it, it, that GCF does affect the um, where the axis of symmetry goes, and it does affect where the vertex is, but it does not affect the zeros. Okay. All right. Um, let's take a look at our homework. I've just got the key up here. So if you need to go over any of these questions. Now, any of the fractions you could write as decimals. I am okay with that. I don't need you to write them as fractions, but uh, they could write, you could write them as decimals if you'd like. If you need to see any of these problems on the board, um, by all means, ask. I've actually got the word problem up on the board already from last period, so I just left it up there. All right, what questions do we have on this worksheet? 
We could go over any of these, all of these, doesn't matter. Uh, over. Did you even do it? Oh, not. Yeah. I need to look at how I was going to say. Did you write down numbers? Let's look on the back. Oh, it's the paper. The homework. No. Monday. Or wait. No, Friday. Why are you making my paper? Any questions from the worksheet? Um, remember that when you submit this, I will be checking for work. So make sure you submit the work along with it. You know that. You know I always check for the work. beginning of the year. Yes. That's fine. That's fine. But I'm just looking for the ones that you like require a little bit more work. Okay. I did that. Yes. Five. Yep. Let's talk through five real quick. Five, please. Uh, number five right here, x squared minus 3x is equal to zero. Now, for this one, this is kind of a weird one because it doesn't have like a constant term, right? So it's set equal to zero. It's set equal to zero. So I should be able to try to factor down the left side. Well, what's the only thing that I could possibly do to factor this left side? GCF. So let's factor out the GCF of an X, leaving an X minus three. So now here are my two factors, X equals zero and X minus three equals zero. So X equals three or X equals zero. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know it was a weird one because it wasn't a full three term polynomial, but we can still do it the same way, factor out the GCF. And then it, it's you know not a difference of squares or anything like that, but we can just take the GCF and Set those equal to zero. What other questions on the homework did we have? Yeah. How do you want to have a time on the quiz? Are you going to have um, something like this for a problem on the quiz? Uh, probably, yes. Yes. Here's, here's the, um, the difference with the word problems. The word problems now have shifted not to can we find the maximum value, but can we find the zero, right? So it's not necessarily finding the height or something, find the maximum height. It's now, okay, how long does it take to come back down again? Like for this one, the guy shot the flare off the boat and he wants to know how far or how long it takes to hit the water again, right? So you basically find the zero of that equation. It's not the maximum. Zero. All right, let me give you the uh, guided notes for today.
Can't even turn my own mic. No. Not in your life. <laughs> hey, don't crack that screen. You just bought that phone. Um, uh, so we said last Friday that the second half of chapter 9 is all about how we solve quadratics. The first part of chapter 9 was how we graph quadratics. The second half of chapter 9 is how we solve quadratics. And I said that we were going to have four different methods to solving quadratics. The first method was finding or yeah, solving by factor. Solving by factor. The second method that we have here, what we're going to take notes on today, is solving by using square roots. Now, let me ask you this. Factoring. Is everything always factorable? No. 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 So factoring only works. It works a lot of the time, but does it work all the time? No. no. The second method, factoring, or sorry, solving by using square roots, is another method that does not work all the time. It actually is a very specific case that when we solve quadratic, we can use this method. The other two methods, the ones that we will learn in section 9, 8, and 9, 9, those ones work all the time. That's why we're kind of separating it a little bit. We're separating the ones that work only some of the time and the ones that work all the time. So let's think back to um, square roots. Now, remember, to take the square root, to take the square root is kind of like the opposite of squaring something, right? So if I asked you what, what, what's 7 squared, you would say 49 because it's 7 times 7. Or what's 4 squared? It's 4 times 4. It's 16, right? Taking the square root of something is finding that number that you can you can multiply together by itself. And that's really your answer. So if I said the square root of 16 would be 4 because it's 4 times 4 is 16. So you're finding the two values that could multiply together to get to that number, right? Now, the issue is, is if, if I had, um, you know, I could possibly have the positive or negative version of that number. Like, it, everybody, look up on the whiteboard real quick. Look up on the whiteboard. What number could I plug in for x to make this equation true? Three, right? Your first response would probably just say three, because three squared is nine. Is there anything else? 81. It could be, shh, list, stop talking. It could be what? I thought somebody said it could be, could be negative 3. Could it be negative 3? Yes, because if I plug this in, I would have to use parentheses. I would have to say negative 3 times negative 3, which is a positive 9. Right? A positive 9. Negative 3 times negative 3 would be a positive 9. So therefore, I know my two solutions would be both the positive and the negative. See? I could square both the positive 3 or the negative 3 to get us back to 9. So therefore, I could have both the positive or the negative square root of 9 as 3 or negative 3. Um, when you take the square root of a positive number and the sign of the square root is not indicated, you must find both the positive and negative root. Sometimes that's called the principal root and the negative root. Basically, what I'm asking you to do here is just write a plus or minus in front of the square root. Because it could be either the positive or the negative version of that number. So that sign is read as a plus or minus sign. A plus or minus sign. So plus or minus the square root of 9 is like plus or minus 3. That's how we write that. That's how we would read that, plus or minus 3. So this is the square root property. It says that if you have an x squared is equal to a number, x squared is equal to a number, then you can square root that number on the other side, and that will give you the solution to the equation. The only catch is, is you have to remember both the positive and the negative root of that number. Like, for example, they give us x squared is equal to 15. If I square root 15, I get a messy decimal. So we're just going to leave it as the square root of 15 for right now. If I take the square root of 15, it's either the positive or negative version of that number that could be the solution to that equation. The positive or the negative uh, version of that number. So let's take a look here. X squared is equal to 121. So to solve this, I would just square root the opposite side. Do you notice how I have an X squared is equal to a number? X squared is equal to a number. You've got to get it solved all the way down so you have an X squared is equal to a number. I square root the opposite side, so it's going to be X is equal to plus or minus the square root of 121. And then you just go into your calculators and you... You square root 121, which is, whoa, yikes. 
which is eleven. The square root the square root is that it's right there for me as, as it is for you. Along the left side, yep, right there. Second and hit that. No, that's the X squared button. It's the arrow pointing up. Is the square root symbol chance? How did you make it to this point? I really don't know. It's, it's right here. This? Second? Hit that button. I go to the X. No. Is that? Okay. This time. So X is equal to plus or minus 11. Positive or negative 11. Positive or negative 11. Right? Because if I wanted to truly check my answer, I could plug in 11 or I could plug in negative 11. And both of those numbers would work. Right? Both of those numbers would work. Let me check another one. Let's see another one. What about x squared is equal to 0? Well, if I go to square root 0, what do I get? 0, right? x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 0, which is 0. Now, is 0 either positive or negative? No. So you would just say x is equal to 0. Remember back when we were talking about graphing quadratics, I know that the zeros, I could either have two zeros, one zero, or none at all, right? The first answer that we had, the x is equal to plus or minus 11, positive 11, negative 11, that's when I would have two zeros. This is the example where I would have one zero, where it would only cross the x-axis once. Let me show you the next one here. What happens in your calculators when you try to solve this? Domain error. Domain error. So if your calculator is giving you an error, reason through. What should the answer be? You think four? So if I plug in four and I get four squared, what do I get? 16. Negative 16? No, positive 16. So maybe it's negative four, right? So if I plug in negative four, what's negative four squared? Positive 16. So is there any number that you can square that will end up getting you a negative out again? No, that's why your calculator is giving you an error. Okay. We would try to square root the negative number, which ends up getting you an error in your calculators because you don't know how to square root a negative number right now. You learned that in algebra too. So you would say, um, for our purposes right now, undefined. You could say no solution for right now, but I like I like the term undefined a little bit better. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. These were all x squared is equal to a number. So if it's not set up in that way, you have to you have to solve it to get to x squared is equal to a number. So let me ask you, what, what do I do to first? to get x squared completely alone. Subtract the 7 over to the other side. So you've got to use your inverse order of operations to get x squared completely alone and then take the square root. It's very important that you take the square root last. Don't square root it right now. We can't yet. The x squared is not completely alone. We subtract 7 over to the other side. I get x squared is equal to 25. And now I square root. Once I get x squared is equal to a number. So plus or minus the square root of 25. So x is equal to plus or minus 5. I will tell you right now that on the quiz on Thursday, there are two big mistakes that people make. The first mistake is forgetting to write the plus or minus. People will forget that all the time. And I have to take points off for it. The second thing is not solving the equation for x squared before you take the square root. Meaning, I'll have people square root right off the bat and then try to subtract. No, you've got to solve it for x squared, then take the square root at the very end. Like, for example, here. What's the first thing I do to get x squared completely alone? I add 49. I don't divide by 16. I add 49 over to the other side. You've got to undo your addition and subtraction first, then undo your multiplication and division. So I add the 49 over to the other side. 
Now I'm going to leave this in fraction form. 16x squared is equal to 49. I divide by 16. I'm going to leave it as a fraction because I recognize that 49 and 16 are both perfect squares. So I've got 49 sixteenths, and now I'm going to square root it. And then I can square root both the numerator and denominator. I don't even need my calculator for this. Plus or minus the square root of 49. And then the 16. The square root of 49 is 7. The square root of 16 is 4. As a decimal, you could write plus or minus 1 and 3 fourths, so 1.75. But either of those would have been acceptable answers. Okay, when you see two perfect squares like that, you can take the square root of the top and then the square root of the bottom to solve it a little bit easier than uh, um, take, trying to take the square root of the whole thing. All right, let's do one more like that with fractions like that. I've got 36x squared is equal to 1. See, again, can I take the square root right off the bat? No, it's not x squared is equal to a number. We need to divide by 36 over to the other side first before taking the square root. Got to isolate the x squared. And now I can square root. I leave it as a fraction because, again, I recognize that 36 is a perfect square and so is 1. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 over the square root of 36, which is 1 6. You could give me the decimal form of that too, but I'm going to leave it as 1 6. Now, let me ask you, do you see on, on any of your front page or your back page, do you see any of these quadratics have just a B term? What do I mean by a B term? Remember, think about standard form of a quadratic as AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. Does any of these quadratics have a B term? Just a number times X. No. So remember when I had said that this is a very special case when we can use the square root property? It's only when the quadratic has no B term. It's only when the quadratic has no B term. If it's got a B term, then you can't use this property. You can't use this solving by, by square roots because you can't isolate just a number time. And X squared is equal to a number. You can't isolate it like that. So you'd have to use another method, maybe factoring or quadratic formula or completing a square. Okay. You can only use this method when you have uh, no B term. Um, sometimes you might have ones that are not perfect squares. Well, then you can just simply go into your calculator and figure out what the square root of 15 actually is. Um, a little bit later on this year, we'll learn how to reduce square roots a little bit uh, in a different way. But for our purposes right now, I'm completely fine with you just saying uh, the square root of 15 and then giving me the decimal. So the square root of 15, oops, the square root of 15 is 3.87. So plus or minus 3.87. And that's my answer. What, what are people going to miss points on? The plus or minus. People are going to forget the plus or minus. I'll tell you right now. Take a look at the next one. What's the first step? Subtract the 90. Don't divide by negative 3. Subtract the 90. Do you notice how there's no B term? The A term is negative 3. The C term is, is 90. The constant term is 90. There's no B term. right? There's no just X term. That's why we can use the square root property. We can solve by just taking the square root. We can isolate the x squared by subtracting the 90, then dividing by negative 3. So x squared is equal to positive 30. And then we square root the 30. x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 30, which 30 is not a perfect square. It's 5.48 plus or minus 5.48.
questions about that? Okay, a couple more. What's the easiest way to isolate the x squared here? Yeah, I would add it over to the other side. I could subtract the 90 over, but then, but then I get double negatives on each side. So what I'm going to do, the easiest route to take is just add the x squared to both sides. So that's going to get me an x squared is equal to 90, and then I can square root the 90. I can say x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 90. which is 9.49. Okay. Go ahead and do the last one on your own. Again, notice how there's no B term with this. There's no BX. There's x squared, and then there's just my constant, t. What's my solution? Undefined. I would subtract the 45 over to the other side. So I get x squared is equal to negative 45. And then I would go to square root it, but that's undefined. You would try to square root the negative number. And again, the reason it's undefined, oops, you would get x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 45. And you cannot square root a negative number. Not yet. Questions about that? Okay, last one is the word problem here. I like this word problem. Uh, we've got a rectangular re retaining wall in, uh, around the garden. Okay. Build the wall around the garden, but she wants it to be a very specific rectangle. She wants the length to be two times the width. She wants it twice as long as it is wide. Okay. All right, well, the length is twice the width. So if the width is x, what's the length? Wouldn't be x squared. If the width is x, the garden is twice as long as it is y. 2x, not x squared, 2x. When I say twice as long, like I've, I've got a five foot length of rope, I want one that's gonna be twice as long as that, it's gonna be 10 feet. So if I've got one that's x, I want it to be 2x for my length. So this is my length, and this is my width. Now, what's my total area of this thing? 578. Sorry, it's cut off on the TV over there. Area, area is 578. Well, area formula for a rectangle is just length times width, right? That's volume. So that's x times 2x. Well, x times 2x is 2x squared. That's my area. Because my width is x and my length is 2x. And now I know what my area is supposed to be. My area is supposed to be 578. So now I've got an equation I can solve. Do you see any b terms? No. So I can use the property, I can use the square root property. I can divide by two and then take the square root. So let's divide by two. I get 289, I believe. Yeah, 289. And then I can square root it. I would say plus or minus the square root of 289 is equal to x. And I square root 289 and I get 17. So it's plus or minus 17. Now, can you have, is it logical to have a negative answer? No, because you're dealing with length. So I throw out the negative 17. I only use the positive solution in the equation. I throw out negative 17. So you would say 
The width is 17 feet. So the length is double that, 34 feet. So again, the quiz on Thursday will be solving by factoring and solving by square roots. Solving by square roots, again, I, I, I can't give you any B terms when I solve by square roots. And I'll be specific. I'll write on there. It's all about using square roots. Okay. All right. So long, everybody at home.